It's such a privilege to be here this morning. And as I was saying that it's been two years since I was here. And I hope that you guys are in sound mind and sound body. Amen. Amen. My wife is here with me today. Sister Knott, can you wave? And our children, Elizabeth, Ali, and Nate has those red pants on. So it is truly a privilege to be among friends. And as we journey through this wilderness of woe, we're going to pray once more as we open God's word. Please pray with me. Loving and eternal Father, we have assembled in this house of worship to hear a word from on high, and we pray that you will speak to our hearts individually and collectively. And may this morning's message find lodgment in our hearts, and may it bring forth fruits to your name's honor and glory, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We have chosen for our theme this, this, this week, this Sabbath, Biblical Biographies. Our opening text was read to us so ably. We'll be looking at a man this morning by the name of Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshai. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, the Apostle Paul encourages us that whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. And we have been admonished by the servant of the Lord that there are certain chapters must be read by us once per week. Psalms 105, Psalms 106, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Why? Because these chapters, she says, rehearses the history of ancient Israel. That Psalms 105, Psalms 106, which is a pretty lengthy chapter, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 must be read by us at least once per week, she says, because they rehearse the history of ancient Israel. In the book Education, we are told as an educator, no... Is that me? No part of the Bible is of greater value than its biographies. Now we spend a lot of time focusing on the prophecies, and that's good. And I tell folks that the prophecies are not the message. They are a part of the message. And the Bible says the legs of the lame are never equal. We've got to beware of a limping ministry. We ought to be balanced in all aspects in regards to our message. And the bi biographies we are admonished to, to study because they give us a true pictorial of life. Now prior to his translation, Elijah has been given one more assignment by God. And he has been admonished by God to do three things. One, he must anoint a new prophet. His name is Elisha, a milder prophet. He must anoint a man by the name of Jehu. We have Elisha the prophet. He must anoint Jehu king. And he must anoint a king, a pagan king named Heziel. Now I can see the rationale of anointing Jehu and also Elisha. But I can't see why would God have his manservant anoint a pagan king. And then we find this reference in the spirit of prophecy. And then why it says God com commanded Elijah to anoint the cruel and deceitful Heziel king over Syria. 
that he might be a scourge to adulterous Israel. He would serve the purpose of God as the goad to prick Israel back on the path of integrity. We will consider Jehu this morning. Now, beloved, Jehu is no ordinary character. As a matter of fact, Jehu was raised up by God to be a great reformer in Israel. He, he was given a task to set things right. In his assignment, he was not to leave root or branch. He was not to spare Agag like King Saul. His ministry was to uproot both root and branch. He was to cut off Baalites without remorse and without exception. But as you survey this man's unfortunate life, we find this dark cloud that Jehu was doing God's work but not in God's appointed way. The Bible admonishes us that all things must be done decently. And in order, we are told that order is heaven's first law. Now we pick up in 2 Kings chapter 9, and the texts are on the screen. You can follow along and you can jot these down. The Bible now says, Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets, and said unto him, Gird up thy loins, take this box of oil in thine hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, many ask the question, why didn't Elisha himself personally go and anoint Jehu? Now, there are so many reasons why. Some say maybe he didn't want to alert people. They knew who Elisha was, and if he was coming through that part of the vineyard, he may attract a lot of attention to himself. So he sent a lesser prophet, an unknown prophet, to do this assignment. Verse 2 now says, When thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshai, and go in and take him, Arise up from his brethren and carry him in an inner chamber. Do this work discreetly. Do it secretly. Verse number three says, Take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and not tarry. What a strange assignment. Beloved, there is a similarity between Jehu and ourselves. He was anointed. And I want to tell you something that Seventh-day Adventism, we are anointed. We are not just like any other religion. We have been commissioned by God and have been given a unique assignment. Leave neither root nor branch. Our job is to tear down and to build up. We must strip before we can clothe people. The Bible says now, so the young man, even the young man, one of the prophets, went to Ramoth Gilead. Verse 5 says, And when he came, behold, the captain of the house were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of us? All of us. And he said to thee, O captain. Verse 6 says, And he arose and went into the house, and he poured oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over thy people, of the Lord, even over Israel. Now, we had a problem because there were two kings now reigning, as you shall see. You can't have two kings, one has got to go. Now you can't have two high priests. Once Jesus has been inaugurated, we need no earthly priests to fill that capacity. And verse 7 says, this is the assignment now, and thou shalt smite the house of Ahab, underscore Ahab, underscore Ahab, 
underscore Ahab. Not just any house. Ahab, there were many houses back then. Thy master, that, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and behold all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Verse 8 says, For the whole house of Ahab. Now again, this young prophet re repeats himself. Repetition. Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall. And that's not pleasant language, but it's in the Bible. That's Holy Ghost language. That's inspired language. Even him that pisseth against the wall and that is shut up and left in Israel. Verse number 10 now says, And the dog shall eat Jezebel. Jezebel with her paint and her mascara has got to go. She had reigned too long. And the Bible says, And there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Now, beloved, I want to highlight some things about Jehu's character. And I hope that God can appropriate these things to our own lives as we look at this man. The first thing I want to highlight was that Josiah, uh, Jehu rather, he had a very boastful and he had a self-righteous zeal. And that's not good. That's not good. And I'm going to read. The Bible says in 2 Kings 10, 15, verse 16, he meets Jehonadad, his captain. Look what Jehu said to this man as he's on the Lord's errand. The Bible says in verse 15, And when he was departed thence, he lighted Jehonadad, the son of Rechad, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart. In other words, are you as righteous as I am? Are you as right as I am? And the fellow said, it is. And then he gave him his hand and both of them took off in a chariot. Beloved, the Bible tells us this. In Romans 3, 10, Paul says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. All that we do and say is because of the tender Jesus. All that we shall ever be is because of God. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says a, a, a child is few born of a days, he turneth to mischief. There is none righteous, but God, the Bible declares. This man was self-righteous, and he was very boastful. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul says, For by the grace of God, I am what I am. Are you a saint this morning? Let me tell you something. It's only by the seer grace of God alone. It is said, Sir Roland Hill was a very upright and decent and moral man. And every time he passed a drunkard on the street, he would say, there go I, but by the grace of God. There go I, but by the grace of God. And as we do the Lord's work, we've got to beware of self-righteousness. And beware of a haughty. The Bible said that pride goes before destruction. Everything in life has its prelude. You know, when you see the skies are dark and ominous, you know that rain cometh. Everything in life has its prelude. And exaltation has its prelude. It's humility. And destruction has its prelude. It is pride. Wherever pride goeth, destruction followeth. Ellen White says we oftentimes measure ourselves by ourselves. Isn't that right? And we oftentimes compare ourselves 
by ourselves and we say, well, if I'm better than that brother, I'm all right. But when we look at Jesus Christ, how far we are from home. Beware of that kind of a spirit. Now, verse number 15 now said now, verse 16 said now, he continues his train of thought. He said now, and he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Come see me work for Jesus. You know, there are some people who can't do anything for Jesus unless somebody is accompanying them. Come see me sing for Jesus. Come see me preach for Jesus. Come see me witness. <laughs> Come see my zeal. Now, we need zeal. Don't get it wrong. We need zeal to do God's work. But we don't need a boastful zeal and a self-righteous zeal. Ellen White lists several qualifications for service. Uh, Romans 10, Paul says that many have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Some have knowledge and they ain't got no zeal. Some have a whole lot of zeal and they ain't got no knowledge. We've got to be balanced. Ellen White lists several qualifications for service. She lists knowledge. You've got to know what you believe. She lists benevolence. You've got to be kind and compassionate. And nothing is more repulsive than a mean, present truth, Seventh-day Adventist. You've got to be kind and compassionate and merciful. You've got to be eloquent. You've got to know what to say and how to say it. And there was a young man in Charles Spurgeon there. He said, Mr. Spurgeon, why do I have to go to school to learn how to preach? After all, my grandfather went to school, didn't go to school, and he preached. Spurgeon says, because the folks your grandfather preached to didn't go to school. <laughs> your congregation, you've got to know what you're saying, lest you confuse people. But then she says, we've got to have zeal, church. All of these are needed for uh, work, for, for, for essential for work, but they've got to be love for Christ in the... So we need zeal, don't get me wrong. We've got to be zealous for Jesus, but not having a boastful and self-righteous zeal. The second thing I want to highlight about Jehu is that we're building. Jehu was very reckless in his zeal. You know, when I was young, we used to sing this song, Written by Franklin Belden. Let every lamp be burning bright. The darkest hour is nearing. The darkest hours from earth long night. Before the Lord's appearing. Then, my brethren dare then. It's with godly fears the. Says, draweth nigh. Let every lamp be burning. When I was young, we never had electricity. We were poor. And we had lanterns. And now and then you had to trim the lamp, lest it just burn recklessly. And so with our zeal, we can't be reckless. We've got to be tactful. And I've learned it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And you make sure you sing with the right spirit at the right time. Or else your right can be wrong. Are you with me? So he was reckless in his zeal. And I'm going to show you now. Let's look at this man's assignment now. 2 Kings 9, 16. The Bible now says now. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. For Jehor Joram lay there. Now Joram was wounded. He was Ahab's son. Now by this time, Ahab is dead. He was wounded in battle, and he is now nursing his wound at Jezreel. And Ahaziah, king of who? Was come down to what? To see his body. So we have two kings. We have Joram, which was king of Israel, uh, uh, king of, uh, uh, Israel, and we have Ahaziah, king of Judah. Now let me ask you a question. Who was Jehu told to smite? Ahab's house. Is that right? Now look at the Bible now. What it says now. And there stood a watchman on the tower of Jezreel. So Jerum's palace was surrounded by a watchman. And a watchman spied out 
a, a, a dusty uh, blanket coming down the street. And he spied a company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, take a horseman and send to meet him and let him say, is it peace? Is everything well, Jehu? So this king dispatched a messenger. And the Bible now says now, so they went on horseback to meet him and said, thus saith the king, is it peace? Now look what Jehu said. Jehu said, what hast thou to do with peace? Turn he behind me. In other words, you better fall in line, young fella. Ain't no peace here. And as the watchman is on the tower, he noticed the messenger did not come back again. So he told Joram that. And Joram now said, send a second messenger on horseback. Are you with me? And say, thus saith the king, I come in the king's name. Is it peace? And Jehu answered, what has thou to do with peace? Turn in behind. In other words, you better fall in line, fella. Ain't no peace here. Finally, brothers and sisters, the watchman said, hey, king, the second rider hasn't come back. So he he even he cometh again. So J, uh, J, J, he says now, and the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshai, for he driveth furiously. He driveth like a madman. Jehu was known for his reckless driving. Now, I must admit, upon this point, I often type wanted to imitate Jehu's Mission. I hope my ministry will be like one of Jehu. Not no more. Amen. Not no more. Muhat Gandhi once said, limping is still walking. <laughs> and I'd rather limp into heaven than run furiously into hell. Amen. He driveth furiously. Now, Ellen White says this. Testimonies to ministers, 3.30 says, all who are longing for some engagement, some ministry that will represent Jehu riding furiously will have opportunity enough to distinguish themselves. God will give you time to discover how you're riding for him on his mission. I want you to follow me now. So, Je so Jerem now, bear in mind he's now injured. So he props himself up now. And the Bible says in verse 21, and it said, make ready. And his chariot was ready, and Joram king of Israel, and Ahaziah king of Judah, went out each in his chariot. Now, both kings went out to meet this rider. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth. This was the same vineyard that his mother usurped. You got to connect the dots, church. Verse 22 now says, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu. He said, Is it peace, <laughs> Jehu? And Jehu answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? No, stick a pin. You see, I'm a Jamaican by birth, and I'm an American through naturalization. And where I'm from, you can get away with a whole lot of things. But if you want to get a beat down real quick, you just talk about somebody's mother. Now, in American culture, it's a whole different thing. As a matter of fact, when I was in elementary school, uh, two little boys were at it. And one boy said, your mother's house is so small, the mat at the door says, well... <laughs> And the other fired back says, your mother here is so nappy, she needs painkiller to comb it. And they went back and forth, and it was funny. And I said, where I'm from, man, you want to get her beat down, you just talk about somebody's mother. And my beloved, the Bible says, and Joram turned his hand and fled and said to Ahaziah, there is treachery. In other words, did you just hear that? 
what that man said to me? And the Bible says in 24, and Jehu Je drew a bow full of strength and smote Joram between his arms and the arrow went out his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. Joram is dead. That's one. The house of Ahab is now crumbling, a deck of cars. But then Ahaziah was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I learned this from this man. You've got to be careful who you keep company with. Amen. You know, when I was at Oakwood College, the campus was polarized. I was there with Jeremiah Davis, and we had uh, Wallard, and, and we knew who was who. And there were some guys I didn't hang around with because their arguments were just so loose. It was full of carnality. And these guys were future ministers. And Ahaziah, king of who? Judah. Now bear in mind, there was no prophecy against this kingdom. Saw this, and he says, I need to get out of this place quick, fast, and in a hurry. <laughs> Maybe I, I shouldn't have rode along by the garden. And Jehu followed after him and said, smite him in his chariot. And he died there. This was recklessness because there was no prophecy. Second time that young prophet reiterated, the house of Ahab, the house of Ahab, the house of Ahab, the house of Ahab, the house of Ahab. That's two. That's dead. Now Jehu isn't finished. The Bible says, Ellen White now says, now many are slow to learn the lesson that the spirit manifested by Jehu will never bind hearts together. She says, it is not safe for us to bind our interests with our Jehu religion. And let me tell you something, Jehu has many descendants today. They have many descendants today. And how do you know what Jehu religion? You know, it's amazing. I, I, you know, I had a buddy of mine, and we went to Oakwood together. And I see the spirit of Jehu in this man's religion, and it is, it is frightening. He was my roommate for three years. He slept on this side of the room, and I slept on this side of the room. For every book he has, I have. It was so bad when we got our book voucher, we decided to buy a spirit of prophecy books and photocopy our textbooks. We worked at Oakwood Campus Church together. We worked together, and he did a sermon. And the title was not good. And the title was Oakwood's, Oakwood College, The Gateway to Hell. And I said, that's not fair, because you went to Oakwood, man. Didn't you graduate? Didn't God keep you? The same God that kept you can keep others. Now, it's one thing if you're going to highlight one or two professors and, and warn folks, beware of those professors. But to castigate the entire school, you can't do that. And you shouldn't do that. And so Jehu now, in his quest for reformation, he was just capping anybody. We've got to be careful. She says that is an unsafe religion. And it will end in doom and gloom, as you shall see in a moment. Jehu now meets Jezebel. Bible now says now. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tied her hair and looked out the window. This is the first time Jezebel mascara is mentioned in the scripture. And she was the first woman to put it on. She made herself sex sexy to seduce the man of God. And Ellen White says, that spiritual Jezebel, just before she meets her demise, will try to make herself seductive through her art, through liturgy, to seduce the very men who have her debt warrant. And we see it all through the ranks of Protestantism. She made herself attractive, and then she uttered this statement. And when Jehu entered at the gate, 
she said, hath Zimrin peace who slew his master? In other words, don't you know who your queen is? And Jehu didn't even answer her. And Jehu lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on who? Hold on. Stick up in. He didn't say who's on the Lord's side. Now, when you look, when Elijah was on Mount Carmel, he didn't say who was on Elijah's side. He said, who was on the? But in this case, he said, who was on Jehu's side? And uh, they looked out, there were three eunuchs, and he said, throw her down. So he threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall, and the horses then trod under her feet. And after that, Jehu then sat down, and he had a hearty meal. He ate, and he drank, and said, oh, you know what, that woman, after all, uh, she is a king's daughter. Give her a king's burial. And by the time the soldiers went out to get her cadaver, the Bible says, and they went to bury her, and they found no more than a skull and her feet and the palm of her, her arms. Some dogs had taken her limbs. And the Bible says, wherefore they came again and told him, said, the word... Of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah the Tish, by saying, In portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the carcasses shall be as a dunghill, etc., etc. Beloved, that's three dead. I want you to count with me. This man is leaving a holocaust in his train. Then we find this now. 2 Kings 10, verse 1 now. The Bible says, And Ahab had how many sons? Now hold on, hold on. What kind of religion would permit a man to have 70 sons unless you have the true religion, which is one wife? You see, back in those days, religion was very promiscuous. And Jezebel's religion allowed one man to be in church and he had several wives. You know, I was preaching in England and I don't know what, I had deviated and made a statement. It was regards to uh, marriage and remarriage. And I said, there's only one grounds for divorce. And it's not because she burnt the beans. It's because of adultery. And the person who is guilty cannot get remarried. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you are in that, I pity you. And when I went home, I got a call on WhatsApp. And the lady said, you know, I was sitting in your service and I want to ask you a question. Now, you know when folks phrase it like this, you know it's them. I have a friend. <laughs> and the friend, you know, divorced and married another man. But they're, they're happy now. They're serving the Lord. And I said, let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, your friend, what was the grounds? Was it adultery? And she said, I don't think so. And I said, well, your friend is in a very peculiar situation. Because after all, children were born to that marriage. You know, the way of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. man. What a tangled web we weave when we don't follow God. And then she asked me, what should I do? <laughs> yeah, I knew it was her after all. How she, and I said, well, you know what, sis, I want to tell you something. Be honest. You've got to go to God, man. You've got, and I gave her some passages to read in the spirit of prophecy, and I said, go to God. And like Nike, whatever he says, just, you just do it. He had 70 sons. Now look what, and Jehu now wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders and to them that brought up Ahab's children, the babysitter, saying, Take that, the heads of the men of your masters, your son, and come to Jezreel tomorrow. In other words, I want all 70 of their heads. And these men were afraid of Jehu. They said, this man, not even two kings can come against you. Whatever you said, we're going to do it. 
And the Bible says, and it came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons, 70, and slew 70 persons and put their head in a basket and sent them to Jezreel. That's not a bedtime story that is in the Bible. Now let's add now. Now I am not a mathematician, but one plus one still equals two. And if you add 70 plus three, that's how many? That's 73. That's a whole congregation in some of our churches. That's 73 people thus far. But then it goes on a little bit further. 2 Kings 12, 14 and uh, 12 through 14. This is where you see another recklessness of Jehu now. And he arose now and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was at the shearing house in the way, Jehu met with the brethren or the brothers of Ahaziah, king of who? Not the house of Ahab now. And said, who are you guys? And they answered, well, we are the brethren of Ahaziah. And we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. Is that right? <laughs> Is that right? And the Bible said this in verse 14. And he said, Jehu, take them alive. And he took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even 40 and 2 men, neither left any of them. If you add 73 and 42, what do you get? How much is that? 115? All right, I'm going to take your word for it. I didn't add it up, right? That's carcasses left in Jehu's trail. This is this man's religion, his reformation and revival. 42 brothers dead. But then the Bible says now, and when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab, right, in Samaria, till he had destroyed according to the saying of the prophet that Elijah spake. So he slew all the rest of Ahab's family, fulfilling the prophecy with the exception of Ahaziah and Ahaziah's 40. So he killed 43 people recklessly in his religion. You know, there's a time and a place for everything. And just because it's right doesn't mean it's the right time. You know, as a matter of fact, I was doing a campaign down in South Georgia at Maycomb. Under this big tent, every night, a woman would say, reverent not. Every night as we shook hands, she would say, reverent not. Now we know that what the Bible says about reverent. But I, listen, I just tolerated it because they were coming out to the meetings and they didn't know much. And, I, and finally, we had a sermon and we preached, call no man on earth reverend. And I saw her, her eyes opened up and then she said, Bishop not. <laughs> now what if I had said to her, how dare you call me reverend? Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> Only he alone is I may have crushed her hopes and may have won the argument and lost the battle. And as present true people, quotation, we are notorious for that. We are notorious for that. Beware of this religion. But it goes on now. Beloved, it is not an easy thing to maintain a balance in the Christian life. We, human nature, we have a tendency to push towards extremes, and thus many are fanatics, she says. One great preacher said, if the town clock be wrong, a thousand watches will busy the ticking error. There will be late appointments all over town. Employments line will form too late. Business deal will be deferred. The horses won't get effort on time. The cantographers will oversleep. Lunch and dinner schedule will be off. Markets will not open if the town clock be off. And let me tell you something, if our spiritual clock is off, 
we will affect others. No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. That's why we are told, of all the sins that God will punish, none are more grievous in his sight than those who encourage others to do wrong. Those who make others fanatics or push others over the extreme. We've got to be careful that we maintain a healthy balance in the Christian life. Now, so he was boastful and self-righteous in his zeal. He was reckless in his zeal, but then Jehu was very deceptive. He used deception to carry out the Lord's work, and we can't do that. As a matter of fact, you know, when I was at school, and I didn't follow this advice, I was told by one of my teachers who, told, who teaches evangelism, he said, listen, when you go out to do your campaigns, you need to have the deacons all stationed in the tent or the church. And when you make your appeal, you give the signal, and these deacons will come on up. Oh, Because when they break the ice, it will inspire others to come. I said, no, sorry. That's deception. <laughs> That's not the Holy Ghost working. That's not right. If somebody's going to move, let the Holy Ghost move them. Not because I have prompted somebody to move. The Bible said of Jehu now, 2 Kings 10, 18 says, And when Jehu had gathered all the people together, he said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. I'm going to have a big sacrifice, an ecumenical service for Baal. And the Bible says, now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal and all his servants and all the priests. Let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do for Baal, which was a lie. It was a lie. Whosoever shall be found wanting shall not live. But Jehu did it with what? Or deception with the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. And sometimes this can backfire. When I was in West Palm Beach, a famous evangelist came down. We all know him. And this man is notorious of inviting first day singers to his campaign to open up. And he had one, and I was there, and I went to spy out the land, Ella Bush. And I was sitting in the back. All the term was packed. And when the lady got up to sing, Tamika Hawkins, she took the mic and she said, I had no idea I was going to sing to Adventists. She says, my, the person who books my appointment just let me know last night. And then she said, it ought to be known I am not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I don't believe what they teach. And this was the opening, not of the campaign. You see, she had caught the hook because she was the hook to bring others. And she realized her fans were there. And she didn't want to confuse them. So she set the record straight. And that practice is still done today. Why can't we use our singers? We have many who can sing. And if we can't sing, we can hum. Mm. <laughs> and the Bible says, now we are told, beloved, to exaggerate truth is to promulgate error. Be careful how we stretch the truth. Let your yea be yea. And your nay be nay. And Jehu went to Jehoab, and he took and he said, and he looked at them and said, let, let, make sure none of the servants of the Lord is here, but only Baal worshippers only. We know how it goes. And it came to pass, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and destroyed Baal. Brothers and sisters, he slayed them. He murdered all the worshippers of Baal. I've lost count now. I want you to follow me now. And not just that. The Bible says, and they went forth and they break down all the images of Baal, all the altars of Baal. And the Bible says, thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. He eradicated 
root and branch. There was no prune in his religion. He eradicated bill worship. Everything was torn down. Every article of furniture, any pic picture that had some kind of resemblance of bill worship, it was gone. Jehu did that. But then, the same passage takes a downward spiral. He was temporary in his zeal. Meant that his zeal burned out. And I'm going to show you. The Bible says in 2 Kings 29 and 31 says, How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nadat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from them. Now, just in case you don't know, the Bible tells us a sin. He says, to wit the golden calves that were at Bethel and that were at Dan. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord of Israel with all his what? And for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Beloved, and the Bible says now, he reigned for 28 years, and Jehu slept with his father, and they buried him where? And that's the wrong place. Jehu's zeal was burning, isn't that right? I mean, look at this man. This man eradicated everything, but somehow his zeal burned out. The Bible says, I returned and saw under the sun. The race is not for the swift. It's not how you start the race that God is concerned about. It's how you finish. And I want to tell you something. I want to finish strong for Jesus. What about you? Amen. I want to finish strong. And we can only say well done to our work when it is well done with us. Solomon 2 Samuel 1, 27 says, How are the mighty fallen? And the weapons of war, they perish. Weapons of war, weapons of war, weapons of war. Ecclesiastes 19, 18 says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war. For one sinner destroyeth much good. The wife says, As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Here it is now, the Jehuites, weapons of war. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare. These are people who defend the faith aggressively. They can't bear to hear the mantras. They can detect any trace of Romanism. They're very vocal in their protestation. Will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon a solid rock. And they, they, even though they seem as strong as Jehu, they will yield to temptation. And I learned something. You know, psychologists say that most criticisms are subjective. It is true, you know. You, 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 you think about it. They say people who ramble on about some seductive sin over and over and over again, they themselves are usually guilty of it or tempted by it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. They, those who have a great light, beloved, this morning we've got to examine ourselves. Amen. Saints, do not fool yourself. Let, let me tell you something, saints. Do not deceive yourself. Amen. The man who says, I can't fall, he has fallen already. Hallelujah. He has fallen already. I was in cyber school, and one man got up and said, I got a PhD. Nobody can deceive me. <laughs> You're deceived already. <laughs> the Bible says, Paul beseeches us. He says, examine yourself. 
not the preacher or the conference. <laughs> we are notorious for that. Examine yourself. Now, let me tell you something. He says prove. Now, examine ain't proving. Now, there are many people who will pass examination. They won't stand the proving. What do you mean? A man is about to buy a car. If he's a prudent man, he's going to examine the car. Isn't that right? He'll go on car facts and make sure there's no accident. He may fly the hood and, and he's, I must go prove this car now. Let me take it on 285. Let me step in it. If you hear a clunk, 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 it passed the examination, but it didn't pass the proving. Many of us, oh, we look so strong in the faith. We can quote passages after passages. We know them alphabetically. We seem so strong and steadfast for Jesus. But examine yourself. Now this word examine is a pregnant word. This word has a kind of scholasticism to it. A boy has been to school, isn't that right? After a certain weeks in school, his professor puts him through a series of exams to see if he has actually learned anything. And by the way, the examination is coming. You better know what you believe. Let me tell you something. You know, since I'm doing campaigns all the time, and I'm seeing a trend in my meetings. You baptize 70 out of the 70, 30 are Adventists. And you get the same response from the Gentiles as from Adventists. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You get it over and over because saints were not studying. Some let the preacher study. Some let Moses Mason study. <laughs> he do your studying for you. So the word examine has a scholastic connotation, but it also has a medical connotation. Man, a man breaks a bone. He goes to the doctor, and what happens? He gets a medical exam. He may have to do a what? That's examine. That's good. Now, the doctor say, the patient say, Doc, I feel something. And the doctor will say, but the x-ray didn't see anything. I'm going to go a little further. He says, we're going to do an MRI. Now, what the x-ray failed to pick up, trust me, the MRI will. So when Paul says, examine yourselves, he says, don't just do a surface work. You've got to go deep down in the crevice of your heart. Examine yourself. We are told many acts that pass for good works, even deeds of benevolence, when closely investigated, will be found to be prompted by wrong motives. I'm telling you, church, she says many receive applause for virtues they do not possess. We call a man honest, and he's the most crookedest man in the church. You call a man faithful, and he's an adulterer. You don't know. We just action, but God views the motives. Examine yourself, beloved. She goes on to say, the search of hearts, he inspects the motives, and often the deeds which are highly applauded in the church. When closely looked at, not more than base hypocrisy. Let me tell you something today, beloved Richard Baxter. You got to get this book. It's called The Reformed Pastor. Ellen White says, she quotes him in Great Controversy. She says, you ought to get his book. You need to get this book. Whether you're a clergy or laity, you need to get The Reformed Pastor. It is a powerful book. Richard Baxter said this in his book. The hand that makes another dirt. He says, the hand that makes another clean must not itself be dirty. He says, take heed to yourself, lest you should be void of that saving grace which you offer to others. And be a stranger to the effectual working of the gospel which you preach. Richard Baxter says, and at least, and at least while you proclaim the necessity of a savior to the world, your heart should neglect him and you should miss him of interest in him of his saving benefits. He says, take heed to yourself, lest while you, lest while you per take heed to yourself, lest you perish while you call upon others to take heed of perishing. 
unless you famish yourselves while you prepare their food. And in my study, I've got to check myself because summer preparation is not devotion. And sometimes I get my warriors confused. Get up in the morning, oh, get build, build, build a sermon. That's not devotion. I'm studying to give. I need to feed myself. He says, many have warned others that they come not to the place of torment, which they have hasted themselves. He said, take heed therefore to yourselves first that you be that which you persuade others to be and you believe that which you persuade them to believe and have heartily entertained that Christ and spirit which you offer to others. You got to get the book. He that bade you love your neighbor as yourself did not apply you should love yourself and hate and destroy both yourselves and them. Amen. You've got to examine yourself. Let me tell you something. Jehu's religion. Jehu was prizing the fruit but despising the root. And that is with most reformation in our churches and revivalists. They prize the fruit. Long skirts and veganism and all these are an outgrowth of what God has done for you. Amen. They prize the message and the delivery, but they despise the root. Jehu was prizing the fruit, destroying Baal worship and the acts, but he didn't take time to examine the root. Mr. Spurgeon says, many are prizing the, root, prizing the fruit and despising the root, and they shall lose both the fruit and the root at the same time. He goes on to say, to labor for Christ is a pleasant thing, but beware of doing it mechanically. And then why calls it, she says, break up the, she says there's an evil with hollow formalism. Amen. We come, we sing at the same time. Mm, uh, no, we got to have order, don't get me wrong. He goes on to say, and this you can only prevent by diligently cultivating a personal what? He goes on to say, my brother and my sister, I beseech you, church, it may be you will undertake so much service that your time will be occupied and you will have no space for prayer and for reading the word. You're so busy with church work and this and that that you starve yourself. Amen. Beware of that. He goes on to say, the half an hour in the morning for prayer will be cut short and the time allotted for communion with God and the eve and, and the evil will eventually gradually be entrenched. He says upon this engagement and upon that occupation, he says, when this is the case, I tremble for you. You're prizing the fruit and despising the root and trust me, you're going to lose both the fruit and the root. He goes on to say, you are killing the steed by spurring it and denying it food. He goes on to say, you are undermining your house by drawing the stones from the foundation to pile them on the top. He goes on to say, you are doing your soul serious, serious mischief if you put, here is now the punchline, if you put the whole of your strength into that part of your life which is visible to man. And forget that portion of your life which is secret between you and your God. And that was where Jehu went wrong. He gave all of his time to the what was visible to man. And he neglect that which was visible between God and God and him alone. When you look at Jehu, a sad, sad, sad biography. When you summarize his life, he did not yield his mind and heart reverently and obediently to the worship of God. He followed a kind of animal impulse which drove him forward in opposition to Baal and to Ahab, but he never stopped to inquire what more would God have done or what more have I to do, God. He never stopped to inquire. 
He was just doing, doing, going, killing, going, riding, riding. He never stopped. Never stopped to inquire God's will. His commission was from God. His commission from God was right, but his heart was wrong. His heart was wrong. Oh, the commission was right. Go! But his heart was wrong. Fourthly, the death sentence was, uh, death sentence from God was right, but his methods uh, as an executioner were wrong. And don't come tell me that methods don't matter. It does matter. Because if we use the wrong method to do the right thing, many do evil that good may come. The methods do matter. And I want to tell you something. You don't have to compromise. You know, I was, I was, I was called, I went to Slough, and I, I, I was asked to do a campaign, and the pastor said, I want you to come in and do a one-week. I said, stop. There's no such thing as a one-week campaign. That's like a revival or something. Are you, no, you can't do one week. I said, listen, man, honestly, I don't go anywhere unless I have at least three weeks. And that is cutting it. And if I go three weeks, I go six nights per week and three times on Sabbath. Amen. I said, take that to the board. He says, oh, not, you don't understand, man. Man, these folks in England, man, they won't come out. I said, listen, only on those terms. Finally, he came back and said, okay, the board approved it. Got to Slough. Hey, the good Lord bless. Man, every night we were packed. It was so bad on Sabbath, man, on Sabbath, you, you, you guys are cozy here. On Sabbath, all the kids had to sit in circles on the podium. They circled me like a tribe leader. They, and they just, I was in a little circle, couldn't move. They didn't have enough space. Every Sabbath. And when the meetings came to an end, to God be the glory, we baptized 35 people. He said, we have never, he said, I, felt, I feel so ashamed. He says, could you give us another week? I said, I got to go back. <laughs> it's not so much the method, it's the message. And I didn't have no soloist singing beside me every night. I had to play a clip from you too, most nights, just to get a, a, a song going. But God blessed. God blessed. The methods were wrong. Fifthly, fourthly, he was impulsive and impetuous, and drove furiously, and when the work was in his mind, but he had no heart, no heart service for Jehovah. His heart was not in it. Let me tell you something. As a commander, he was well-versed in military tactics. Of course he was, oh, captain. Yet he refused to defend his own country and suffer his empire to go to ruin. He never defended his own soul. That's treason. All the knowledge you know, all the texts you know, all the prophets you know, and you don't use it for yourself? That is treason, man. That is treachery. Yes. Sixthly, Jehu was angry at other people's sin, but not his own. Oh, I can't stand it in her. Girl, I went to this church, and I'm telling you, I couldn't care. but not his own sin. He drew on vengeance on other people's sin, but rationalized and justified his own. Ah, oh, it's just culture. Ah, oh, it's not so bad after all. Jehu's religion is unsafe. He served God with his hand, with his mouth, with his feet, but not his heart. Amen. Beloved, let me tell you something. True Christian zeal, I've learned this the hard way. True Christian zeal not only moves the tongue, not only moves the foot or the hand, it must move the whole heart. Amen. This is where it begins and this is where it ends. It never moved his heart. It moved his hand. Oh, he drew a bow. That brother rode furiously, but it never moved his heart. Never moved his heart. 
You know, when I was in England, I, we had one day off. And the church, they gave me 200 pounds. That was a good gesture. And they said, evangelist, go treat yourself. Go to the clothing store. I'm, I'm not big on clothes. I dress pretty simple. I'm a lover of books. Amen. And so I said to my guide, I want you to take me down to the Metropolitan Tabernacle in, in, in London. That's Mr. Spurgeon's church. And you know, the church was bombed by Hitler, so the church doesn't remain, but the, 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 the structure is. But they have a huge book, book uh, uh, library. Oh, man. All Puritanic authors. Nothing but Puritans. High-grade Puritans, man. And the guy dropped me off. I had 200 pounds in my pocket. And I tell you something, I decided, as God blessed me, I'm going to bless my church. And we were going through the Pilgrim's Progress, and I spent 100 pounds, and I bought Pilgrim's Progress for all my members, officers, hardback copy for some of them, and some got the paperback. <laughs> and I spent 100 pounds on myself. And I'm telling you, the guy, I got there at 9 o'clock. I left there at 5. I took my time, and I went through every book. And then this book caught my attention. I've heard about it. It's the last words of saints and sinners. And what this man did, he compiled the last words people uttered on their deathbed. Let me tell you something. It is no joke. I mean, some of the things people say on their deathbed, man, it, 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 it is just amazing. And I've learned in that book, you can't fake it. Oh, you can't fake it either. What you sow is what you reap. And what goes in is what's coming out. And as I was skipping, skipping, you know, see if I knew any famous person, bam! Samuel Wesley. Now, he was John Wesley's and Charles' uh, father. And I had the privilege while I was there to visit John Wesley, the son, uh, his house. And it's in pristine condition. Man, you go to the house, man, a three-story. And I went in his room where the bed and then the lady said, that's his prayer spot. And he had a, a, a chest made. I think I have some pictures. A chest, let me see. A chest, that's not a, a chest made. And then she says, that was his stool where he knelt and he prayed from 4.15 to 5.15 every morning. And she said, but you can't touch it because it's so old. And when they walked down, I, <laughs> I knelt, I kneeled down, touch a picture of history. And on his deathbed, Samuel Wesley got the two boys together. And his last words to John and Charles were, he said, John and Charles, the inward witness. 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 In other words, what is inside must be a replica of what is outside. Your heart and your speech must synchronize the inward witness. And it led, John was the preacher, uh, Charles was the, 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 the composer, and from that, he wrote this wonderful hymn, which many don't sing today, but it, it is such a profound hymn. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. A heart that always feels thy blood so freely shed for me. A heart resigned, submissive, meek, my great Redeemer's throne. Where Christ, where only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone. A humble, lowly, contrite heart, believing true and clean. Where neither life nor death can part from Christ who dwells within. He says, a heart in every thought renewed, a full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. Amen. Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart, come quickly from abode, write thy new name upon my heart, Thy new best name of love. Amen. Is that your desire this morning? Amen. A heart like that? A heart where God reigns supreme.
I pray that you will not let sleep close your eyes until you're sure for a certainty that you have a heart like that. Father in heaven, oh God, we realize that the greatest element in the world today is deception. And the deception that is pervasive in Christianity, even in your church, oh God, is that of self-deception. People who think they are near the kingdom when they are far from the kingdom. Those who think that they're really gathering, but in reality, they are scattering. Oh God, help us to turn the flashlight, the searchlight on our hearts. May we examine our course of action, oh God. May we examine what we are doing and Lord, may we make sure that we're doing it in Christ's appointed method. Lord, we're not saved by works. We get no brownie points with Jesus. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God lest no man can boast. And we realize that obedience is a byproduct of grace. And that grace has within it the germ of obedience. Yes. And all that we do and say and are, it is just an outgrowth of the love we have for you. Yes. Oh God, may we remember Jehu. And may these things linger in our minds. And may we do all in our power to, to stay clear of a Jehu's religion. This we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.